Hello everyone! Welcome to our first Reefsco Live episode of 2021. We are so excited to have you all tuning in with us today. So we have a very special broadcast for you today as we'll be talking about our Quiet Ocean Survey results with you guys. So our team has spent the past eight months looking at how fat fish populations in Grand Cayman have responded to changes in human activity as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Sabrina Weber and I will be your topside host today. We also have Dr. Gretchen Goodbody Gringley. She's underwater with us today. She's our director of research and she will be talking to you guys from Soto Reef right here on Grand Cayman, one of the sites that we've actually been surveying. We have people joining us from all over the world today. We're so excited to have you guys and everyone watching, you will be our dive buddies and you'll be following along with us today. We have our YouTube chat that you can ask us questions on and we're going to try and do our best to get to everyone's questions. For any kids out there, if you could ask your teachers or your parents to sign in for you and we'll try to do our best to get to everyone's questions. Just so you guys know, we're going to be checking on our team maybe every once in a while to make sure that their air is okay and that they're doing okay. This is completely normal. Uh, we just want to make sure that everyone's doing fine underwater. So let's get started and let's introduce you to Dr. Gretchen Underwater. Thanks, Sabrina, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm talking to you from 30 feet underwater here in Grand Cayman at one of the most heavily trafficked dive sites. We're really excited to talk to you today about our Quiet Oceans project. Awesome. Thank you, Gretchen. So let's give you guys a bit of background on why this episode of Reefs Go Live is so special. So when the COVID-19 pandemic began in March of 2020, the Cayman Islands took strict measures to reduce our risks, including several, several weeks of intense lockdown and three months of limited activities. And even after we were allowed to reintroduce our normal lifestyles, our borders remain closed to tourism and they still remain closed to this day. So CCMI saw this as an unprecedented opportunity to look at our fish populations and our coral reef ecosystems and to see how these react to less people in the water. So as soon as restrictions eased, Dr. Gretchen and her team, including myself, started surveying five sites along the west side of Grand Cayman and in and around the Georgetown Harbor. Um, so Dr. Gretchen, firstly, can you tell us why this kind of study is so important? Sure, Sabrina. As you said, in t July 2020, we began to survey these reef sites as soon as we were allowed back in the water after lockdown. This is really important because we've never experienced an opportunity like this before, where the oceans have been so quiet. And so we wanted to investigate how does this reduced activity affect our reef communities, and in particular the fish communities. Understanding how these types of activities will impact our fish communities is really important for future management strategies. Awesome. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, so tourism has been growing consistently in the Cayman Islands for many years. And the west side of Grand Cayman, where we actually are now, is not only a busy tourism area, but is also the main harbor and cruise ship port. We are also in a Marine Pet Protected Area, or MPA, which means that the government has protected this section of the nearshore reef. So, this particular coastline is hugely important connected ecosystem, while it also serves as a contributing infrastructure for shipping and cargo. On a busy day, hundreds of people could come in and around this site. So we wanted to see what happened to fish abundance and biodiversity during this unique time of quiet in our ocean. Human impact on precious ecosystems, like coral reefs, is a genuine concern for reef managers, divers, snorkelers, and ocean lovers around the world. The human impact actually has a specific name. It's called anthropogenic. A big concern for governments is how we can strike a balance between what the world needs, what, sorry, what humans need, versus what the world needs to begin be healthy. Climate change, overfishing, and pollution are putting our oceans and our coral reefs under huge strain, and the work we and thousands of other scientists do help to keep our oceans healthy for the future. Dr. Gretchen, can you discuss some of the anthropogenic impacts that we are hoping to assess with this study? Yes. What we were specifically looking at with this study was the impacts of 
are on water activities as humans. Activities such as boating, fishing, shipping, and diving. All of these activities make noise, and noise has a major impact on fish populations. So understanding how noise is going to affect their behavior and distribution will again help us as we begin to manage our reopening strategies. Awesome. So how are we assessing these impacts of reduced human traffic on these fish populations in Grand Cayman? We're assessing the abundance, diversity, and biomass of fish populations across five sites using the transect method. So I know that you actually have a transect with you under water Gretchen. Do you mind showing us quickly how it works? Sure. I do have a transect right here. So a transect is a very simple tool that we use to measure and assess fish populations. And this can be easily replicated across multiple sites to standardize our estimates. For our surveys, we actually use a 30 meter long transect line. And so what we first do is we find a piece of dead rock or coral that we can attach the transect line to. We then swim along the transect and we record any of the fish that we see. We also estimate their sizes. So we look a meter to the left and the right, and a meter up from the transect line. And we kind of create a visionary box in our minds, and we record any of the fish that we see along this. Uh, we take underwater paper with us, and we take pencils, and that's how we record our data underwater. That's right. I can show you right here. Oftentimes, I'll even carry a notebook to write down my data. Perfect. Thank you for the example, Gretchen. Uh, so actually, can we talk about some of the challenges that we have with these surveys underwater? Sure. Some of the main challenges that we have when conducting these surveys is actually remembering all of the different fish species that we can identify on along our transects. Yes. Many fish species look very similar underwater, and a lot of them can actually change the way they look at different stages in their life. That's a great example, Gretchen. Um, so two species that are actually pretty difficult to differentiate underwater are the striped and the princess parrotfish. Um, so here you can see there's the princess parrotfish and there's the striped parrotfish. They have a similar body shape and form and they often are found together. Uh, those were the initial phases. And so it becomes quite difficult to differentiate them at times underwater. The biggest distinguisher is that the striped parrotfish actually has that yellow smudge on its nose. Um, but even if you study the book as hard as you can, it becomes a bit difficult underwater. Some of these fish look different from the examples that are given in this book. Um, so it's really important to know some of the key characteristics of these fish. And then if you don't know what something is underwater, you try to write down some of its key characteristics and we find it later on. That's right, Sabrina. It's a lot to remember while you're underwater. Definitely. Um, so before we get to our results of the Quiet Ocean Survey, what do we know about our reef communities here in Grand Cayman before COVID? Well, in 2018, we actually surveyed the reefs here in Grand Cayman. And we found that our fish populations were in fact quite healthy. And given the bustling activity that was taking place at the time, it's really a testament to how strong our protection measures already were. Right. Um, so we know that many species we find on a healthy coral reef all work together in a complex relationship to comprise an ecosystem. A contributing factor to this balance is what we actually call biodiversity, uh, which is a variety of species in a system, in an ecosystem. And in the Cayman Islands, we're known for having reefs that are pretty rich in biodiversity. Around the world, coral reefs are declining at an alarming rate. So it's really important, and so are fish populations. So it's really important that we understand how reefs are changing over time, and we understand why certain reefs are healthier than others. Yes. Every species 
species has a specific function on the coral reef. Understanding how each different species is contributing to the overall function will help us understand how to protect them for the future. Awesome. And of course, we need healthy reefs to protect our coastlines from storms. And we also rely on them for food, medical innovations, tourism, and so much more. Um, so we understand this is quite a unique opportunity to understand how fish populations reacted in this period of reduced human activity. So before we continue, Greg. our activities, even just our minimal local activities, we began to see a decrease again in fish populations. Awesome, Gretchen. Actually, we have a question for you here. Our first question. Um, so, have you ever seen a fish respond to a loud noise underwater? Oh, many times. Usually, you know, as a diver, when you want to get your dive buddy's attention, you'll use something metal to bang on your tank. Oftentimes when we do that, We'll notice all the fish just dart right down into the reef and hide in all of these nooks and crannies that you can see around me. Wow, great example. Thank you, Gretchen. I also know that our results showed that the number of fish species found also significantly increased during the study, and they have remained stable since lockdown. Why is this important, and what species are important to us here in the Cayman Islands? That's right. We found a significant increase in the number of species that we saw on our surveys in 2018 compared to what we saw in 2018. Sorry, 2020 compared to 2018. And this indicates that our activities pre-COVID were affecting the presence of certain species in our reef communities. Did you see any changes in specific types of fish? Yes. In fact, we saw an increase in the number of surgeon fishes, chubs, jacks, and groupers. All of these species are transient, and therefore they could have moved to another area of the reef when there was a disturbance in place. What's important is that our previous work at CCMI has shown that certain species, in particular surgeon fishes and chubs, are in fact critical as herbivores, and they contribute to a large amount of algal consumption maintaining our coral cover here in Grand Cayman. Awesome. Those are some great examples, Gretchen. Um, so, dive buddies, you'll also see some of these species that Gretchen mentioned on your activity sheet if you're following along with us. So make sure to check that one out. Algae is a big threat to our corals if it isn't controlled to, by fish. So herbivores are very important to us. Many of your, our dive buddies may actually be familiar with one of our favorite herbivores, the colorful and popular parrotfish, which we love to see here. So herbivores are animals that eat algae and other delicious ocean plant life, and they're really important to our ecosystem. So Gretchen, can you talk to us a little bit about parrotfish? Yes. We found a significant increase in the number of parrotfish along our surveys after COVID. Parrotfish are a really critical species, and they've been linked to long-term stability and removal of algae, promotion of coral cover, and overall ecosystem health. Perfect. Parrotfish in general are also beautiful, and they are such a treat for us to find on snorkels and dives here in the Cayman Islands. They also contribute to our beautiful sandy beaches. Can anyone tell me uh, what our sandy beaches are largely comprised of? Any guesses? I'm hoping that you said parrotfish poop, because that is indeed true. Parrotfish poop comprises a lot of the sand on our beaches, which is a fun fact. Alrighty, so Gretchen, the final part of the research showed a change in the frequency of fish sizes. So I personally found it quite interesting to see a lot of the big fish species that I did when we were doing the transects. 
I know we saw a lot of rays and sharks and groupers in particular, the Nassau grouper, which is super important to our food chain and to local tourism here in Cayman. Uh, can you give us a little bit more detail on this? Yes, in fact, we found an increase in the presence of the very large individuals. But at the same time, we found an increase in the presence of the tiniest individuals. So this means that our activities, in fact, affect the entire food chain. Not just the big ones, but also the tiny ones. And can have major implications for the overall health of our ecosystem. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, as a member of the research team, I will say that it was fun to see some of these big fish species and see quite a diverse range of fish. It made the transect a lot more interesting and more challenging, in fact. Um, actually, we have another question coming in. Uh, what was the most interesting or exciting fish that you saw on these surveys, Gretchen? I would say one of the most interesting species that we saw on our transect was a little fish called the bass camelot. Now, you may not be familiar with the bass camelot because we weren't either. And in fact, we had to look it up in the guidebook when we got back to the, to the boat, or to the shore, I should say. And we were, in fact, jokingly calling it the panda hamlet because it looks like it has, you know, the colorations look just like a little panda. Awesome. So let me, guys, let me show you guys the panda hamlet, or moth hamlet, in the book here. It was quite a cool one, and we were actually very excited by it. But you can see how it does look a bit like a panda. So that's a great way, too, to uh, try to recognize some of these fish. Maybe you have to look up their scientific names later on in the book, but it is great to think of some fun names for them that maybe you and your team remember. Um, so, uh, any other interesting th things that you saw on the transects, Gretchen? Sorry, what's that, Sabrina? Oh, actually, we have another question here. Um, so, what suggestions would you have for how to minimize our impact moving forward as we think about borders opening and things getting busier in the water again? That's a really great question. You know, our studies have shown that, in fact, the noise we produce has a major impact on our fish population. So going forward, how can we change our strategies to reduce that noise and ensure the fish are here in the future? Something we can do would be to minimize boat traffic on our highest biodiversity reef sites, or potentially investigate new technologies that incorporate quieter propellers on our largest vessels. Um, hey, Gretchen, can you actually check on your air again for us and let us know if you guys are doing okay there? Yep, I'm good. Yeah, Tom's okay too? Perfect. Okay, thank you guys. Um, so, another question that I have for you now is what impact do you think the reduced human activity has had on the coral? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, because we found an increase in herbivores, we would expect that, in fact, the lack of activity will trickle all the way down to the coral itself. And this is because those herbivores are removing all this algae. You can see here on the reef behind me that a lot of the reef is, in fact, covered with what we call macroalgae. And that is a direct competitor with corals. So if we maintain high abundances of herbivores, they can keep that algal abundance down to a minimum, and this enables our corals to thrive. So we would expect that with reduced activity, we find higher herbivores, and thus we have a healthier coral ecosystem. Awesome. Thank you, Gretchen. And actually, another question for you. Uh, what other positive impacts could have resulted from COVID-19 besides just the reductions in sound? Oh, that's a good question. So, not only has sound been reduced, 
But a lot of people have noted anecdotally that the visibility or the clarity of the water has changed. And they say that, you know, they can see the reef from their balconies. One thing that the change in water quality can do is affect how fish are in fact seeing one another, seeing interactions that are taking place on the reef. And for example, they may respond quicker to the presence of a predator if they can see farther in the water. Perfect. Thank you, Gretchen. That's a really, really good example. And I know I'm sure people here started to realize that the oceans were looking really, really clear as there was less activity. Um, we have a question here from Paul M. What are lionfish populations like in Grand Cayman right now? Huh. Lionfish populations have fluctuated throughout our surveys. We thought that potentially we would see an increase in lionfish with the lack of human activity because, of course, local culling would also be minimized. And, in fact, we did find an increase in the presence of scorpionfish and of particularly lionfish over time. So it is really important that we as a community get back out there and resume our calling activities as soon as possible. Yes, definitely. I know that I have seen quite a few of lionfish in and around my surveys, which is disheartening at times. Um, did you, I know we've also done some similar surveys on Little Cayman. Um, so was there any of a change that you saw in Little Cayman with these fish surveys? We found a very similar result in Little Cayman, which is quite interesting because from the onset, there's less activity there. So we didn't think we would find the same exact result, but in fact we did, which again highlights that even just our minimal activities actually have an impact. And do you, how, what are you thinking, Gretchen? Are we planning on continuing these surveys in the future? We're really hopeful that we can continue these surveys as tourism resumes and our borders open up. At present, this is the final set of surveys for this project. But going forward, we're really optimistic that we'll be able to continue. Right, definitely, because the more that we're able to do this for the longer period of time, the more that we can understand um, and we can see what happens when we have human activity reintroduced. Uh, is there anything cool that you can see around you, Gretchen, that you can show us? Well, I'm not sure if you saw, but we've had a tarpon hanging around this whole time. I think he may have left. But we also have seen a lot of little juvenile parrotfish and some really cool tiny little sharp-nosed puffers. In and around me now, I'm mostly seeing some really cool corals, like Stephanocenia here some Orbicella annularis over there, and even just here, right in the middle of Georgetown Harbor, we have this really diverse and thriving coral ecosystem. That's amazing, Gretchen. Yeah, I know oftentimes we see a lot of the juvenile parrotfish on our surveys, and a lot of the sharp-nosed puffers, which is very cool. Um, do you guys think you can take us a little bit closer so we can see the coral a bit better? Alrighty, and tell us what we're seeing, Gretchen. Well, right here we're seeing a lot of small juvenile corals, quite a bit of macroalgae. But we do think that also this would be even more extensive without our healthy parrotfish population. Right, um, and one of the very popular ones we see as well of the parrotfish is our stoplight parrotfish. I know I often see a lot of the juvenile ones and the initial phases and some big terminal phase parrotfish. Have you seen any stoplight parrotfish in front of you there? Oh, all the time. They're on almost every single transect. Um, can you point out uh, some of the different algae on the reef there that you can see or some of the nooks and crannies that fish would be able to hide in on the reef? Sure, I mean, just right here, there's all sorts of little holes, nooks and crannies, different species of algae will live inside the different holes. 
I can see in this hole a tiny little hermit crab. And there's a long fin damselfish that keeps darting in and out. Damselfish are very cool because they will actually guard in this algal bed. And they'll selectively feed on different algae to create a garden of just the species that they want to have living there, which is quite unique behavior. Right, very cool. I do know, yeah, that they're quite territorial and they are the farmers of the reef. So does anyone have any more questions for us today? You can go on to our YouTube chat and write anything that you're wanting to ask Gretchen while she's underwater, anything interesting that you think she's maybe seen, what she's experiencing, what these surveys are like. We love all the questions. Um, I actually have a question for you, Gretchen, while we wait. Uh, what suggestions do you have for moving forward with opening our borders? Sorry, Sabrina, I didn't catch that. Oh, no, no worries. Uh, what suggestions would you have for moving forward with opening our borders? <laughs> so, my suggestion for how we would move forward with opening our borders, uh, I would say that we should just keep in mind the data that we're producing here and how our impacts affect fish populations. And use that data in a quantitative way to assess various models and strategies for reopening and the tourism in the future. Awesome. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, yes, it is great that we have studies like these that can start to inform future decisions. Um, and all needs to be looked at. Did anyone else want to submit any questions to us today? Um, and actually one question we just got in, Gretchen, is what can we all do to help? How can we start to help? Every action that you do as an individual has a larger impact overall. If each one of us takes small actions, together they add up to have a major implication. Just little things, like reducing your single-use plastics, or walking to school, bringing a reusable bag to the grocery store. All of these minor actions add up and can impact the overall reef health. Those are some great examples, Gretchen. And just beginning the conversation is also great. And already asking these questions is a step in the right direction. So uh, we are nearly out of time now. So before we finish up, Gretchen, can you just summarize for people what this research means and how we can include it in planning for the future to make sure that we keep our reefs in the Cayman Islands beautiful and healthy? Yes. You know, overall, our results found that the lack of activity on the reef resulted in an increase in fish and an increase particularly in herbivores. This indicates that our activities or the lack of activity or reduced activity can in fact have a major impact onto the overall health of our ecosystem as increases in herbivores will control algal abundance resulting in greater coral cover and healthier coral reefs. Right. But probably most importantly was the finding that our fish populations rebounded almost immediately. And yet, even after we just began our local activities, which were quite minimal, we saw a response again. And so we can use this information going forward to strategically manage our coral reefs, and in particular, how we use this precious resource. Right, so for countries like the Cayman Islands where the reef system is still relatively healthy, these results can indicate that management techniques could be developed to better support coexistence between the environment and humans. But for countries that have less healthy reef systems, stricter policies would need to be put into place to give the reefs a bit of a break. Uh, but our results from our study do indicate that fish populations can rebound quite quickly if given the opportunity to. And also, human-based water activities do affect the entire food chain, and while fish populations did rebound, 
almost immediately. They were also affected quickly when the activities resumed, which highlights the need for studies like this to understand how we can manage this precious resource. So Gretchen, I have one last question for you. What is your most memorable diving experience here in Cayman? Oh. <laughs> You know, the funny thing is, my, mer my most memorable diving experience was my first dive here. And that happened in 2016, uh, off of Lighthouse Point. And I went out to the May Wall, and all of these fish were surrounding me. And I had come from a place that had very beautiful coral reefs, but really not very many fish. And when I went to the edge of the wall, and I was just surrounded by so many fish, I remember thinking to myself, this is why I love to dive. This is what I want to see when I go diving. And I think that that really speaks to why we have such a strong tourism product here, and also why it's so important to protect these fish populations. That's a great one. I love that story. It really is a magical experience sometimes, and I do... Sometimes we get so used to it, and I forget what it's like to be a first-time diver again, or what it's like to dive in a certain area for the first time. It is pretty amazing, so it's great to appreciate it. We're actually getting in more questions, which is super exciting. Um, so from Aiden, are there any seasonal differences with the coral? Sorry, can you repeat that? Are there any seasonal differences with the coral? And what kind of differences? Seasonal. What? Seasonal. Seasonal? Yes. With the fish? <laughs> with the coral. Uh, with the fish, yes. So fish behavior is very linked to seasonality. They will reproduce at certain seasons, and so we'll get pulses of tiny fish at certain times of the year. Corals also reproduce seasonally. So you will see some seasonal shifts in the size ranges of both fish as well as corals. Awesome. Thank you, and thank you, Aiden, for the question. Um, oh, we also have a question for the both of us, Gretchen. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite fish? Oh. <laughs> it's a hard one. I've never really thought about that before. Uh, I'm going to go with my daughter's, which is the unicorn fish. Because who doesn't love a unicorn? That's awesome. Um, um, my favorite fish is the yellowtail damselfish. Actually, the juvenile version. It's really, really cute. Um, it has bright blue dots all over its body. Uh, and then as it gets older, it, lose some, it loses some of its blue dots, and it has a bright yellow tail. I think it's a beautiful fish. Alrighty, so thank you so much, Gretchen, for all of your information on the Quiet Ocean Survey. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you for all of your questions. Um, that was really great. Uh, it will be really interesting to see some of the longer-term results and as we continue these kinds of studies and as the borders reopen and human activity increases once again. And for you guys watching at home, as Gretchen mentioned, you can all help protect our reef for the future. All of our choices do count, and everyone can be an ocean steward by helping to reduce your anthropogenic impact on the marine environment. As Gretchen mentioned, some of these examples, carpooling, reducing your plastic consumption or other consumption, trying to reuse as much as possible, trying to be good divers and snorkelers and respecting your environment, these are all things that go a long way. And just beginning the conversation is a step in the right direction. So thank you guys so much. For more information on how you can help our reef, plus more information our, on our Reef Go Live activity, please look at our website, www.reefresearch.org. Um, and you can also tune in to our next broadcast on May 7th, 2021. Thank you guys very much. I hope you learned something, and I hope you had fun with us today. Bye! Bye!